studying the mo movements of the heavenly bodies and using them to determine the time of day and the season of the year has been part of human culture for thousands of years. And it's been a driver for our subject, mathematics. For example, the first trig tables were produced by the astronomer, um, his name I've forgotten, in the second century BC. Um, and there's lots of interesting mathematics there. And my talk therefore is part of a long historical tradition. So this video is a recording of the session I gave at the 2021 Conference of the Mathematical Association, which was a marvelous occasion where getting on for a thousand people got together to share their ideas about mathematics and teaching of mathematics. So I've edited it to remove some of the inevitable sillinesses of uh, a live Zoom session. And as you've already seen, some of the sillinesses are not inevitable, but just the result of my silliness. So back to the recording. Uh, so that's my title and that's me. And that is my inspiration, which is my birthday present from my wife a couple of years ago. So this is the sundial and this is the equation of time. Now, if you've not met that before, it uses the word equation in a rather archaic sense. It means a sort of correction and it converts solar time to clock time. Now, let me explain what I mean by that. So clock time's easy. Um, clocks tick away at a constant rate. So every second, same length, every minute, every hour, every day is the same length. Solar time is what it says on a sundial. So it's noon um, solar time whenever the sun is due south. And we divide the time between one noon and the next into 24 hours. Now, it turns out that when we do that, the, the duration of that day from noon to noon is not constant if you measure it on a clock. Now, that may surprise you a bit. After all, the Earth is just spinning at a constant rate, isn't it? Well, the geometry of the solar system isn't quite that simple, so it's not constant. If you accept that just for the moment, that will mean that solar time and clock time get out of kilter. And this is how you correct it. So it says, for example, it's a, it's a graph. And it says that in February, you might have to add as many as 14 minutes to what it says on the sundial to get clock time. And in November, you can have to subtract as much as 16 minutes from solar time to get clock time. So the main purpose of my talk is to explain how that happens and explain why we get a curve of this particular shape. Now, I'm not going to do any, um, any uh, algebra and solve any equations. I'm not going to give you an equation for this curve. It's all geometry. My aim is to help you develop a geometric intuition about why this happens. But before that, let's look at some other features of the sundial. So what do you notice? What do you wonder? So among the things you might notice are that the hour lines are not evenly um, distributed. You might notice that this sundial is specific to my location, both latitude and longitude. Um, you might notice the bees, they're just there because I like bees. Well, I think I bet you've all noticed this is a lump of metal sticking out of the middle of the filly angle. Um, now then, um, this is a precision instrument, and so we're going to have to use words with some precision, including perhaps some that are new to you. Um, and lump of metal doesn't quite hack it. So the lump of metal is called the style, and the gnomon is the thing that casts the shadow you read the time with. So at this time of day, that edge of the style is acting as the gnomon, and that is its uh, shadow reading about 12.32. And you can see that in the morning, um, this will have been the, the gnomon and the shadow will have been over here. Okay, so you probably all know that the, the angle of the style is, that, is there because the gnomon has to be parallel to the Earth's axis. But let's make sure we understand that first and get, get our heads around that. And that will introduce us to some new words and concepts that we're going to need. So um, the basic situation, of course, is the Earth goes around the sun. And there it is, uh, going around the sun. So um, that's its orbit and that's its axis, which is of course tilted with respect to the orbit. Now, the thing we're going to make a lot of use of is this red dot here. It's called the subsolar point. And the subsolar point is the nearest point on the surface of the earth to the sun. So it's also the point on the, on the earth, surface of the earth where the sun is directly overhead. And it's also the point where the line from the center of the sun to the center of the earth meets the surface of the earth. And it always lies between the Tropic of Cancer and the Tropic of Capricorn. In fact, that's the definition of the tropics. So the Tropic of Cancer in the north here is as far north as the subsolar sub point ever gets. Um, and the Tropic of Capricorn is as far south as it ever gets. And of course, relative to the Earth, the subsolar point is whizzing round it once a day and slowly moving from the Tropic of Cancer to the Tropic of Capricorn and back again. So now let's look at a globe. And we'll start understanding how the new one has to be parallel. So, right, so um, here's my globe, and there um, is me and my sundial uh, sitting up there. 
And I've marked the meridian, so we can hold it here. Um, the meridian is a, a great semicircle from the North Pole to the South Pole. And I've marked my meridian, which is the one I'm sitting on. Now, for most of this talk, we can assume I live at Greenwich. Um, I don't, of course, but we'll deal with that later. So this is the Greenwich meridian. And so um, the subsolar point always lies somewhere between here and here at noon. So noon is when, the proper definition of solar noon, is when the subsolar point is on my meridian. It would be somewhere between here and here. Of course, if I lived um, in the southern hemisphere, it would be north of me. And I lived in the tropics, it would sometimes be north of me and sometimes south. But for me up here, it's always south of me. Right, and solar noon is here, with subsolar point is here. And the solar day is the time it takes to get once, from my um, meridian, once around the Earth and back onto my meridian. Now then, suppose it's noon on some day, then, um, the, I can look at the sun and I'll be looking out in this direction and the sun will be somewhere in this plane with my meridian. Subsolar point is somewhere between here and here, so the sun is somewhere in that plane. So, so long as my gnomon is also in that plane, so will its shadow be. And therefore it will fall to earth on my meridian going north. So the shadow of the gnomon will be pointing north every day of the year, so long as the no one is in this plane. If it's not in that plane, then you can detect that, imagine you're the sun for the moment, as the subsolar point moves north and south, the bit of the south, the bit of the earth you can't see, which is where my shadow is, varies, even though the sun is still due south. So the no one has to be in that plane. Okay, now let's move on six hours and get to six o'clock in the evening. So now um, we're somewhere on this, the subsolar point is somewhere here. And when I'm looking at it here, the sun is somewhere in that sort of direction. And the same principle applies. So long as my gnomon is here, in this plane here, which is parallel to the six o'clock meridian, but through my sundial, then its shadow will always be east at six o'clock in the evening. So looking from the top, um, um, so it's got, the gnomon's got to be in this plane, to tell the right time at noon, it's got to be in this plane to tell the right time at six o'clock in the evening, so it has to be in the intersection, which is parallel to the Earth's um, axis. Okay, now I want you to remember this six o'clock plane, um, this one, this one here. So um, it's parallel to the Earth's axis and it's orthogonal to my meridian. So, um, and the thing about this plane is that uh, most of the day the sun shines on this side of it. At six o'clock in the evening, the sun is in that plane. And after six o'clock, it shines on the back of it from over, from over there somewhere. OK, so once we've got the gnome on parallel to the Earth axis working at noon and at six, it works any time. So, for example, four o'clock in the afternoon, that's this, uh, that's this meridian here. And again, uh, so long as uh, my gnome on is parallel to the Earth's axis, it's in this four o'clock plane now, which is the plane through my, um, through my gnome on uh, parallel to this meridian, meridian, and so its shadow will always be pointing in the same direction. But notice, if I look at the sun, as we move away from midsummer, the sun is not only lower in the sky, it's also further south. If I turn the globe round, so I'm moving from looking at the sun in midsummer to moving at some other time of year, and I'm looking further south as well as looking lower in the sky. So let's summarize that. Axis has a tilt. Oh, I won't read them. Now, there's another way of thinking about this um, further south business. Um, if I stand on the surface of the earth and look towards the sun and take a photograph at the same time every day, this happens to be four o'clock in the afternoon, taken in Greece, this is the picture you get of what the sun does. So it is, as you move away from midsummer up here, it's further south as well as uh, lower in the sky. Now, don't worry about the wiggles in that for the moment. The wiggles in the figure of eight, that's the equation of time written in the sky. And that happens because this is taken at six o'clock on the clock. If we took six o'clock solar time, it would look like that. And that is that four o'clock plane. So the four o'clock plane is actually the plane that includes that line and me. There's yet another way to think about this. So this is what you see in the sky if you stand on the surface of the Earth and look towards the sun at four o'clock. If you stood in the middle of the Earth instead, 
and the Earth had magically become transparent, you'd see exactly the same shape, of course. But now the line from your eye to the sun would pass through the surface of the Earth at the subsolar point. So this is the path of the subsolar point at a particular time on the clock throughout the year, from midwinter to midsummer. And that is, of course, a path it takes mid or solar time. So I reckon this is about 5.30 GMT. So that's where the sun is five, five and a half hours after Greenwich solar time. And that's where it is at 5.30 GMT. OK, we'll come back to all that stuff later. So, um, that, so my sundial is specific to my latitude, which means that that angle is 51 degrees and 55, 51 degrees and 55 minutes. OK, so that's well the gnome on board. So what about the dial? Well, in many ways, the most natural place to put the dial is orthogonal to the gnomon at right angles. Because then the hour angles will be equal, whereas when, it's, when the gnomon's tilted, of course, they can't be. Um, so that's, that's called an equatorial sundial because the plane of the equator, um, because the plane of the dial is parallel to the plane of the equator. So can you see the problem with a sundial like that? Well... Think about winter. In winter, the subsolar point is south of the equator all winter long. And so it's south of this plane. And so it doesn't shine on this plane at all. So there's no shadow on it. So this sundial won't work in the winter. So what do you do about that? Well, one of the nice things about an equatorial sundial is because the hour angles are equal, you, have, you can have an adjustable one, which will work anywhere in, on Earth. And what you do about the winter is you have another one on the back. And if you notice, look closely, you see the hour angles go the other way around. So that's a pretty useless sort of sundial, at least in England, because it means in the winter, you sort of have to kneel down in the mud to see the time. Um, okay, so what about an equator at the sundial, a uh, sundial at the equator? So the, um, the there, the gnomon has to be horizontal in order to be parallel to the Earth's axis and oriented north-south, of course. So there it is, that one's actually in Singapore. So that is the, no well, strictly that piece of metal is a style, and that is the scale on which you read the time. That's quite fun. Um, you can also have a vertical um, dial. Uh, that'll only work when the sun's shining on that wall. Um, but uh, it's quite difficult to work out the hour angles then, but, but it can be done. Okay, so now let's go back to my sundial and look at the fact that it's specific to my longitude. So I don't live at Greenwich. I live two degrees west of Greenwich. Uh, and two degrees corresponds to eight minutes of time. Um, so it takes 24 hours for the sun to go right round. So it, it's four minutes per degree. Um, so it's, the sun is due south here in Presbury eight minutes after it was in Greenwich. So if I bought a sundial off the shelf, I'd set it up in my garden, I'd read the time Presbury solar time. I'd then add eight minutes to get Greenwich solar time. And the equation of time strictly converts Greenwich solar time to Greenwich mean time. So I'd then make the correction using the equation of time. So if I've got um, a sundial made for me, well, I've got some options, haven't I? I could include the eight minutes in the equation of time and just shift this graph up eight minutes. But I think that's not what usually done. It's certainly not what's done here. Instead, the scale is moved around. So let's look in a bit more detail about how we actually read this sundial. So at the moment, we're reading using this gnomon and reading the time here. Um, in the morning, we were using this edge and reading it here. So at local solar noon, when the sun is due south, the shadow of the whole of the style fits in this gap here, and we jump from reading the time there to the time there. This is called the noon gap, uh, but you'll notice it's not at noon. It is, in fact, at eight minutes past noon. Um, so this dial um, reads Greenwich solar time. So when this photograph was taken, it was 12.32 Greenwich solar time. So then I looked at the equation of time. The photograph was taken on the 26th of March. And it says here that we have to, we have to add seven minutes um, on the 26th of March. So it was 12.39 GMT when that photograph was taken. Okay, um, one more thing we can get out of this. Um, so we said that this is the gnomon in the afternoon and that in the morning. So if we take those hour lines and extend them into the middle, they meet where you'd expect them to at the bottom of their gnomons. At six o'clock local solar time, which of course is eight minutes past six on the scale, 
uh, the lines just graze across the, the top of the style like this. And in fact, the plane of the top of the style is the six o'clock plane that we were talking about before, because it's parallel to the Earth's axis, it's got the gnomons in it, and it's orthogonal to my meridian, which is the plane of the sides of the style. So that is in fact the six o'clock plane. So the sun lies in that plane every, every evening at six o'clock. And after six o'clock, it's shining on the back of it. So it can no longer see this edge. It can only see this edge. And so if we take the, these lines and extend them into the middle, you'll notice they cross over. Now, not all sundials get that right. And if you see a sundial uh, that's made accurate, accurate, accurately enough that you can tell that that's happening, then you know you've got a sundial made by a proper sundial geek who knows his business. Okay, so now let's have another look at the equation of time in a bit more detail. This is a straightened out version. Let's see what it's telling us. So on this day, early in January, it says we have to add five minutes. Let's, so let's suppose it's noon on this particular day and it says add five minutes. The next day, it says we have to add a little bit more than five minutes. So it's telling us that getting from noon on this day to noon on that day has taken slightly more than 24 hours. In other words, the positive gradient of the equation of time corresponds to a longer solar day, and the negative gradient corresponds to a shorter solar day. Now, looking at that curve, at first sight, it looks a bit like a sine wave with a period of six months, doesn't it? But it clearly isn't that, because this loop's not, this hoop, heat peak is much bigger than that one. So in fact, there's a, an annual thing going on as well. So here we are, there's an annual component and a six monthly component, and they're roughly added together. So there are two things happening that change the, the, the length of the solar day, and we need to understand both of them. Now, I don't want you get running away with the idea that these are simple sine waves and that this is the sum of them. That, although that is approximately true, in detail it very much isn't true. Um, so, and here's an example. I said I wouldn't put any equations up. Well, I'm not going to solve any. Um, it doesn't really matter what any of these symbols are, except that E is an angle. And any time you see an angle and its sign in the same equation, you know you're in for trouble as regards an analytic solution. So the principal reason that I can't give you an equation for the equation of time is that there isn't one. It can only be solved numerically. Okay. Um, so question is, how long is a day? So I'll give you the philosopher's answers first, and it depends what day you mean, what you mean by day. So let me go back to um, stopping machine and we'll have, go back to the globe and we'll talk about three different sorts of day. So we've already met um, the solar day, which is, solar, which is the time it takes for the subsolar point to go from my meridian round the earth and back to my meridian. Now we also need the sidereal day. The sidereal day is the time it takes for the Earth to spin on its axis relative to the universe at large. So there we go. Spins around like that. Now, um, that is, of course, constant because that's just the Earth speed the Earth spinning at. And that's 23 hours and 56 minutes. And that's constant throughout the year. But whilst it's been doing that, uh, the Earth has moved around the sun a bit. So if you are the sun, we've moved down to here a bit. So we have to spin a little bit more to complete the solar day and get the meridian pointing back to you at the sun. That little bit extra takes about four minutes. And it's that four minutes that varies through the year. I'm going to call it the extra four minutes, but it, it's really not quite four minutes, it varies. So there are three sorts of day here. There's the GMT day, the clock day, if you like, which is 24 hours exactly. There's the sidereal day, uh, which is 23 hours and 56 minutes and is constant. And then there's that solar day, which averages 24 minutes, but varies. And it varies in two ways, um, one annually and one six monthly. So we'll start with the annual one because that's the easier one. And it has to do with the eccentricity of the Earth's orbit. You may know that or the, um, the Earth's orbit is not circular, but slightly elliptical. Those of you who teach ellipses will know there's a thing called eccentricity, which measures how uncircular an ellipse is. It's zero for a circle, and it's very small for the Earth's orbit. It's very nearly circular, but not quite. And this photograph illustrates that rather nicely. So the left-hand half is a photograph of the sun at perihelion, when we're closest to it, which is on or about the 3rd of January. And the right half is a photograph at aphelion, when we're further farthest, on, the, on or about the 6th of July. Right, so on this picture, I've exaggerated the eccentricity enormously. 
um, to see what's going on. So here's the sun at one of the focuses of the ellipse, not at its center. And here's the orbit and here's the sun whizzing round. So when we're at perihelion and closest to the sun, the earth is moving faster. That's the ice skater's arms business, put her arms in, she spins faster. Conservation of angular momentum, if you like. But even if it weren't moving faster, because it's closer, as it moves around, it sweeps out a bigger angle. So these, these effects both apply. So as we move through one sidereal day, we move, we go through a bigger angle relative to the sun at perihelion than we do at aphelion. Now then, this, let's take one sidereal day. So at the beginning of the sidereal day, my meridian is pointing at the sun along here. One sidereal later, sidereal day later, the, it's still pointing in the same direction down here. Um, but now to complete the solar day, it's got to spin around and point to here. So it's got to turn through that angle, which is of course the same as that angle. So it has to spin through a bigger angle at perihelion than it does at aphelion. So the extra four minutes is longer at perihelion than aphelion. So the solar day is longer at perihelion than at aphelion. And if we look at the annual component here, um, we see that the steepest gradient corresponding to the longest solar day is here on the 3rd of January. And the steepest negative gradient is there on, on the 6th of July, roughly. Okay, right, now hold on to your hats. We're gonna do the six monthly component. Um, this is trickier. And um, in fact, in one way, some way, that's the, this is the reason I'm giving the talk, because when I got the sundial and started researching all this stuff, I read several explanations of the six monthly component and I couldn't understand any of them. Um, although I could sort of follow the logic, but I just couldn't get a geometric picture in my head. So uh, I, th I think I found a way to do that. So I hope it works for you too. So, um, but we need some more, one more word. Let's go back to this picture and I'm going to add the ecliptic. The ecliptic is actually a word that has a number of closely related meanings. The meaning I want today is as this circle on the surface of the Earth uh, where it intersects the plane of its orbit. So the subsolar point is always on the ecliptic, of course, um, and it moves around it as, as the seasons move. Notice that the ecliptic um, always reaches up to the Tropic of Cancer, just below where the, the axis is tilted. Now, um, of course, mean, meanwhile, um, uh, the Earth is spinning all the time. So this ecliptic circle, you can't draw it on the surface of the Earth. It moves too fast. Um, but if you imagine for the moment that the Earth were not spinning and it was going around, the, going around the sun like this, then you could paint the ecliptic on the surface of the Earth. And what would happen is that the subsolar point would simply move around it once in the year. OK, so now we need to go back to the globe. And now what we're going to do is imagine a solar day. So we're going to start on the, on, at noon on the 18th of August, when the subsolar point is here on my meridian. And this red circle is the ecliptic at noon on the 18th of August. So I'm going to take the solar day um, and break it into two, the sidereal day and then the extra four minutes. And the sidereal day, I'm going to imagine that first of all, the Earth spins on its axis without moving around the sun, and then it moves around the sun without spinning. Of course, in reality, it does those two things together, but we can track what happens to the solar subsolar point more easily if we consider them separately. So first, the Earth spins on its axis uh, relative to the universe at large, but doesn't move around the sun. So sort of nothing happens, really. The subsolar point started there and it finishes there, having whizzed around the Earth once. OK, now the, um, the, uh, the Earth moves around the sun without spinning. And we said just now that if that happens, we could paint the, uh, paint the ecliptic on the Earth and the subsolar point would just move around it. So here we are. I have painted the ecliptic on the surface of the Earth. And so the subsolar point will just move around it like this. So how far will it move? Well, the ecliptic is a great circle. So its circumference is the same as the equator, 40,000 kilometers and we're moving a 365th of the way around it, which is about 110 kilometers. So we're moving 110 kilometers around the ecliptic. Okay, so let's just recap that. Of course, for solar day, the subsolar point first whizzes around the earth, and then it moves 110 kilometers on here. And then the extra four minutes, it just gets back to my meridian along its new line of latitude, which is a little bit further south on the 19th of August. Right, now then, in summer, in midsummer, we're starting here and the ecliptic sort of like that. 
So the 110 kilometers is due east. At the equinox, um, the 110 kilometers has a noticeable south and a southerly component to it. So it doesn't get so far east. So it doesn't take so long to get back to my meridian. Not only that, but the lines of longitude are further apart here. So we don't have to cross so many of them and we cross them at the rate of one every four, four minutes, of course. So both effects go the same way. So it's quicker to get back uh, in, in the extra four minutes back to my meridian at the equinox than it is at the solstice. And it's the same for the other solstices next. Of course, for winter solstice, it, it's due east down here and, uh, and the autumn equinox is like that. So overall, the extra four minutes is shorter at the equinoxes than it is at the solstices. So the solar day is shorter at the equinoxes than it is at the solstices. So let's go back and look at those components. And there we are. So the six monthly component, the steepest gradient corresponding to the longest solar day is 21st of December, 21st of, and 21st of June. And the steepest negative gradients are in April and September. Summarizing, this is the equation of time. It has an annual component um, caused by the eccentricity of the orbit and a six monthly component caused by the tilt of the axis. Okay, now I said at the beginning that the analemma is the equation of time written in the sky. So let's have a look at that. So I'm going to use the analemma as the path of the subsolar point rather than as a dot in the sky. Um, and I'm going to ask you this time to forget the map on this picture and just imagine that that's the Greenwich Meridian and that this is the analemma at 12 noon. So at 12 noon on the clocks, the subsolar point is somewhere on this curve. At 12 noon on the sundial, of course, it's on the Greenwich Meridian. So if we imagine a day when it, at 12 noon on the clocks, the subsolar point is here, during that day, it, it goes around like this. So by the time it gets to here, where it's saying 12 on the sundial, it's saying slightly more than 12 on the clocks. So in other words, this is a, pl a place where the um, equation of time is positive. This, of course, is midwinter down here. So this must be February when the equation of time is a large positive loop. And this was November when it had a large negative loop. Um, if we look in the sky, of course, it's the other way around. We're sort of looking at the back of it as it were. So this is February over here and this is November here. And if we compare that with the equation of time, which I've now written this way, you can see it's the same thing really. So starting at the beginning of the year, we have the big positive loop here, up here. And then we have a small negative loop over here. And then when we get to midsummer, um, the equation of Time carries on this way, but the NLN turns back and goes, starts going south again with a small positive loop um, here, and then a big, um, small positive loop here, bigger button, and then a small, a large negative loop there. Okay, before we go on, um, here's a question for you. Um, I've searched the internet for a picture of the NLM from the Southern Hemisphere, and here we found one from New Zealand. So is that morning or afternoon? I'll leave you to think about that. Um, now, there's something else we can get out of this. You may know that the earliest sunset in December is a few days before the winter solstice, or the shortest day. So here I've plotted the time. So there's sunset. Um, that's solar noon, and that's sunrise. And this was last December, here in Presbury. Um, right, so what's going on here? Well, this is actually the equation of time. A segment of and each of these dots corresponds to a day um, when it's noon on the sundial and this scale is telling us what time it is on the clock. So this is the equation of time and this here has that equation of time as it were added into what would otherwise be the bottom of approximately a sine curve that would bottom out at the solstice. So that pushes the minimum back this way. So the earliest sunset is about nine days before the solstice and the latest sunrise about eight days afterwards. And if you look out of the window um, uh, at the end of the year, you can detect it's already getting lighter in the evenings, even though the mornings are the darkest they're ever gonna be. And of course, at the summer, a similar thing happens. Um, uh, but it's not so pronounced because the equation of time is less steep in the summer. Okay, one more thing I can get out of it. There's a sort of continuous curve of the, of, the, um, of the equation of time. And the dots representing the days slither about on it because there are 365 and a quarter days in a year. So um, 
relative to the and the sun, the solstice apply happens at a precise moment in time when the subsolar point hits the cap, tropic of capricorn instantaneously so and these dots then move back a quarter of a space each ordinary year and jump forward three quarters of a space in a leap year and so the winter solstice usually falls on the 21st of december but the year before a leap year, it just, when, the, when their dots are as far left as they're going to go, it just slips into the early hours of the 22nd. And similarly, um, in the summer, um, it's actually the other way around. So um, it's you, the summer solstice is usually on the 21st of June, but in a leap year, when these dots are as far right as they're going to be, it just slips into the late evening of the 20th. And something similar happens at the um, the uh, equinox, of course. Okay, now then, let's head head out into space. Uh, so this is a nice uh, little app you can download from the Mathematica website, uh, showing the um, analemmas rather than the equation of time, and it shows you them for different planets, which is quite fun. There's Jupiter. Saturn's quite fun. Sort of teardrop shape. Okay, let's go back to Earth. Um, Another thing you can do is play with the parameters and see what it does. So you can try adjusting the, um, uh, that's the ax tilt of the axis. Uh, you can get some quite exotic shapes. Um, and the orbit eccentricity, woo, again, some really wobbly shapes. Uh, and you can adjust the, um, the relative, uh, where, where the spring equinox, equinox is relative to perihelion, the phase of the two, if you like, that doesn't have quite so much effect. Uh, I don't have any effect if that's not. Uh... Oh, there we go. Right. Um, now, there is a parameter missing here that you might expect to see here that you could play with. What will that be? Well, number of days in the year. So it sort of doesn't matter um, because um, there is actually an underlying curve, smooth curve for the analemma. Um, and there are 365 dots on it, which slither around. And if there were fewer days in the year, well, there'd be fewer dots, but the underlying shape would be the same. Um, and there's a nice way to think about this continuous curve. Suppose that the Earth were tidally locked to the sun, so that the same face was towards it all the time. Then you could put a video camera on the surface of the Earth and take a video in the general direction of the sun and, the su and run it for a year. And the sun would move around in the sky and it would follow the path of this continuous curve. Now there is just such a system in the solar system, isn't it? Which is the moon around the earth. So I wish that uh, NASA had put a video camera on the moon um, and taken a picture of the earth for a month, a video camera, because then you would see the analemma of the earth from the moon. Well, I haven't done that, but I've got the next best thing, which is this. So this is a picture um, taken looking directly at the moon, not fixed, not with the camera fixed to the earth, but looking directly at the moon and the moon wobbles around. And that's caused by exactly the same effect. Um, although it's tidally locked, the moon is still spinning. It just spins once a month, um, but it, and its axis is not orthogonal to its orbit and its orbit isn't quite circular. So you get that effect. And if you imagined a video camera on the surface of the moon looking at the earth, you can see that uh, the earth would wobble around following in some analemma curve. It looks to me as though it would be roughly circular, but I haven't really studied that. That's quite fun. Okay, one more thing. How long is my sundial good for? Well, I've spoken as though all those parameters of the Earth's orbit are fixed, well, they're not. Um, and the one that the, the one I really want to emphasize that change, the biggest change is that the Earth precesses like a top. It does that. It takes 26,000 years to get around that. Um, so it's quite slow. But the effect of that, of course, would change the equation of time because at the moment, um, let's say midwinter here is very close to perihelion, right? At the yes, perihelion here. So perihelion is about here, and it's midwinter. Um, in thirteen thousand years' time, it'll be midsummer. It'll be midsummer at perihelion, and of course, so that means the two the two components of the equation of time would get out of phase. Um, so it does affect the equation of time. Uh, so. I've looked for the oldest equation of time I could find. And here it is. Um, this is uh, published by Thomas Tompion, famous clockmaker, um, 1684. And he's done it to the nearest second, which is pretty impressive. 
Um, and it's very different from today. So it's nearly nine minutes on the 1st of January, which is a, a lot. Ours is only about three at the moment, three and a bit. Um, and when I first saw that, I was a bit puzzled by that because that's too much. Until I realized, of course, that in the 17th century, England was still on the Julian calendar. So that 1st of January is nothing like what we'd call the 1st of January, somewhere back in December. So if we allow for that, we can compare the two. So the blue one is Tompion's and the orange one is ours. Well, it's actually 2010 when I managed to find some data giving it to the nearest second. And they're a bit, about a minute difference, which is not much. So my good son, my son does good for a couple of hundred years or so. I've also plotted um, the difference here in green. Now, what do you spot about that? Well, it's got, um, it's got an amplitude of about a minute. But the other thing is that it seems to have only an annual component. So these two both have an annual and a six monthly component, but this looks as though it's only got an annual component. So what's going on there? Well, that's really a segue into a completely different talk that I'm not going to give, um, but it's all to do with the date of Easter. What? I thought we were talking celestial mechanics here. No, it is to do with the date of Easter. So um, it's really about calendars. So um, the calendar we use, the Gregorian calendar, um, is named after Gregory the 13th. That's Pope Gregory the 13th. And the Pope was interested in the date of Easter. So the calculation of the date of Easter, which goes back to the first council of Nicaea in 325 AD, starts with the date of the spring equinox. And for a very long time, uh, the Catholic Church has used the 21st of March as a sort of official spring equinox, which is when the spring equinox was in 325. Um, and that if you have an official date, it means you can work out uh, when Easter is to be, even if you don't have any astronomers handy. And um, so what was to be done about that? Because by the 17th century, the spring equinox was nowhere near the 21st of March. It was way back about 10 days before that. So what they did was to create a new calendar, which would ensure that the spring equinox would be on the 21st of March or thereabouts forevermore, thereby making Catholic doctrine true. Uh, and that's the calendar we use. Now, the shocking consequence of that is that contrary to what you might have learned at school, the year as measured on our calendar is not the time it takes for the Earth to go around the sun. No, no, no. That's called the sidereal year. And it's actually slightly longer than 365 and a quarter days. What we use is the internoctial year, which is the time it takes to get from spring equinox to spring equinox, which because of that precession business is slightly different and is in fact slightly shorter than 365 and a quarter days. And that is why, um, and that's, and that's why we miss out a few leap years every 400 years and also why this component has only an annual component. Uh, has an annual component. Okay, there we are, I'm done. Um, let's go back to this question. Uh, is that morning or afternoon? Well, in the north, in the southern hemisphere, as we move away from midsummer, the sun moves further north as well as moving further down the uh, sky. So that must be northwards. So we must be looking sort of northeast. So that's the morning. It looks as though it's upside down, doesn't it? Because the, um, the, with the big loop at the top and the little loop at the bottom, it's not upside down. You are if you're in New Zealand. In fact, the, the, the analemma looks exactly the same and is in exactly the same orientation wherever you look at it from and whenever you look at it. It's just that your orientation depends on those things. Okay, um, so, I'll, so it's time for questions. Um, I'll ask you one question myself, well, it's more of a riddle really. We've seen that an equatorial sundial doesn't work in the winter, uh, unless you have another one on the back. Um, a vertical sundial won't work unless the sun's shining on its wall. So let's, when will a sundial like mine with a horizontal dial not work, even if the sun's shining on it? 